Three kinds of Unix. Why? General audience number 74 of March 17th, 1982. We are continuing the reflection about virginity or celibacy for the kingdom of heaven, an important topic also for a complete theology of the body. In the immediate context of the words about continence for the kingdom of heaven, Christ makes a very significant comparison, and this confirms us still more in the conviction that he wants to root the vocation to such continence deeply in the reality of earthly life by opening a way for himself into the mentality of his audience. He lists, in fact, three categories of eunuchs. This term eunuch refers to the physical defects that make the procreative power of marriage impossible. These defects explain the first two categories when Jesus speaks about both congenital defects, quote, eunuchs who were born this way from their mother's womb, and defects acquired and caused by human intervention, quote, there are some who were made eunuchs by men, Matthew chapter 19, verse 12. Both cases involve a state of external necessity, that is, they are not voluntary. In his comparison, when Christ goes on to speak about those, quote, who made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven, Matthew chapter 19, verse 12, as a third category, he certainly makes this distinction to emphasize even more its voluntary and supernatural value and nature. Voluntary because those who belong to this category made themselves eunuchs and supernatural because they did it for the kingdom of heaven. The distinction is very clear and very forceful. Equally forceful and eloquent, however, is the comparison. Christ is speaking to men to whom the tradition of the Old Testament had not handed down the ideal of celibacy or virginity. Marriage was so common that physical impotence could constitute an exception. The answer given to the disciples in Matthew chapter 19 verses 12 through or 10 to 12 is at the same time directed in some way to the whole Old Testament tradition. Let us confirm this point by a single example taken from the book of Judges, to which we appeal not so much for the particular plot, but for the sake of the significant words that accompany it. Quote, grant me that I may go and bewail my virginity. Judges chapter 11 verse 37 says the daughter of Jephthah to her father after finding out from him that she had been destined to be sacrificed by a vow made to the Lord. In the biblical text we find the explanation of how things came to this point. Go, we read a little later, and he sent her away. So she departed, she and her companions, and bewailed her virginity on the mountains. At the end of two months, she returned to her father, who did to her what he had promised with a vow. Judges chapter 11, verses 38 and 39. In the tradition of the Old Testament, there is evidence, no room for the meaning of the body that Christ wants to... Is evidently no room for the meaning of the body that Christ wants to show and reveal to his disciples by speaking about continence for the kingdom of God. Among the personages known to us as spiritual leaders of the people of the Old Covenant, there is none who proclaimed such continence by word or deed. Marriage was at that time not only a common state, but even more, it had acquired in that tradition a meaning consecrated by the promise made by the Lord to Abraham. As for me, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations." I will make you very, very fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall be born from you. I will establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you from generation to generation for an everlasting covenant to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. Genesis chapter 17, verse 4 and verses 6 and 7. For this reason, in the tradition of the Old Testament, Marriage was a religiously privileged state, privileged by revelation itself, inasmuch as it is a source of fruitfulness and of the procreation of descendants. On the background of this tradition, according to which the Messiah was to be son of David, Matthew chapter 20, verse 30, it was difficult to understand the ideal of continence. Everything spoke in favor of marriage. 
not only reasons arising from human nature, but also those from the kingdom of God. In this context, the words of Christ bring about a decisive change of direction. When he speaks to his disciples for the first time about continence for the kingdom of heaven, he clearly realizes that as sons of the tradition of the old law, they must associate celibacy and virginity with the situation of individuals, especially those of the male sex, who cannot marry due to defects of a physical nature, eunuchs. And for this reason, he refers to them directly. This reference has a varied background, historical as well as psychological, ethical as well as religious. With this reference, Jesus in some way touches upon all of these backgrounds, as if he wanted to say, I know that what I'm going to tell you now will raise great difficulties in your consciousness, in your way of understanding the meaning of the body. I shall speak to you, in fact, about continence, and this will undoubtedly be associated in you with a state of physical deficiency, inborn or acquired by human cause. I want to tell you, by contrast, that continence can also be voluntary and chosen by him for the kingdom of heaven. Matthew does not report any immediate reaction of the disciples in chapter 19. We find it later only in the writings of the apostles, especially in Paul. See 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 25 to 40. See also Revelation chapter 14 verse 4. This fact confirms that these words impressed themselves in the consciousness of the first generation of the disciples of Jesus and then bore fruit repeatedly and in many ways in the generations of his confessors in the church and perhaps also outside her. From the point of view of theology, that is of the revelation of the meaning of the body, which is entirely new in comparison with the tradition of the Old Testament. These words are thus a turning point. Their analysis shows how precise and substantial they are, although they are so very concise. We will see this even better when we analyze the Pauline text of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Christ speaks about continence for the kingdom of heaven. In this way, he wants to underline that this state, when it is consciously chosen by man in temporal life, the life in which human beings take wife and take husband, has a single supernatural finality. Even if it is consciously chosen and personally decided, continence without this finality does not enter into the content of Christ's statement quoted above. By speaking of those who have consciously chosen celibacy or virginity for the kingdom of heaven, that is, made themselves eunuchs, Christ emphasizes, at least indirectly, that in earthly life, this choice is connected with renunciation and also with a determined spiritual effort. Continence for the kingdom of heaven and fruitfulness from the Spirit. The same supernatural finality for the kingdom of heaven allows a series of more detailed interpretations, which Christ does not go through one by one in this passage. Nevertheless, one can say that through the lapidary formula that he uses, he indicates indirectly all that has been said about this topic in Revelation, in the Bible, and in tradition. All that has become the spiritual wealth of the church's experience, in which celibacy and virginity for the kingdom of heaven have in many ways borne fruit in the various generations of the Lord's disciples and followers.